Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say a, uh, a few words about, about this lecture tonight. Um, on the behalf of Household Science and Nutritional Sciences Alumni Association, I am very pleased to welcome you all to the Edna, Polk, uh, Edna W. Polk Lecture. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of the history about tonight's event. This lectureship was established by alumni in 1974 to honor Professor Polk, who was considered an outstanding teacher by her students. Edna Polk graduated from Household Science Program at the University of Toronto in 1917. After earning her master's degree from Columbia University, she returned to U of T, where she taught for 43 years until her retirement in 1962. She remained active as an alumnus and a strong supporter of the university until her death in 1982. Professor Polk was an amazing ambassador for the university. We know that she felt very honored to be recognized by this lecture. We appreciate the efforts of the Department of Nutritional Sciences and the Office of Advancement in supporting this event every year um, to ensure that her legacy of great teaching continues. And so on the topic of teaching and lecturing, I'd like to uh, um, ask uh, Professor O'Connor to come over and introduce tonight's speaker. Okay, now for the main event. <laughs> so it um, gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, this year's recipient of the Edna Park Lectureship uh, to Dr. Lawrence Spreet. Uh, Dr. Spreet uh, received his PhD in medical sciences at McMaster University and this is something I didn't know, he did a two-year postdoctoral fe uh, fellowship at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. That sounded very interesting. He's, he's worked a lot in the area he's going to talk about today so I'm, I'm not going to go into his research in, a, in, in any detail but I just wanted to acknowledge that he is a professor and chair uh, in the Department of Health, Human Health and Nutritional Sciences at the University of Guelph. Um, he serves as the chair of the Canadian U.S. Arms of the Gatorade Sports Science Institute and is a member of the IOC Diploma in Sports Nutrition Academic Advisory Board. He is a member of several physiological and exercise societies and is the associate editor for several scientific journals. He's been married to his wife, Anne, for 35 years and going. He has three grown children, and he's, he's done that. And probably the thing that he's most happy about is he's an active hockey player, and he still is playing three or four times a week. And he reminds us it's the old timers, mind you. Right. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Spreet. I learned a long time ago that I got to get the wife in there on all these things. <laughs> uh, oh, good point. Yeah, can I get a copy and I could send it? <laughs> well, obviously I'm extremely pleased to be here, but before I thank you formally, I just want to say that the one thing that really strikes me when I come to this campus, and especially this department, is the history. Because I come from Guelph, where the university only began formally in 1964, and we had a big hullabaloo last year about our 50th anniversary. And then I'm here lecturing about someone who got her undergraduate degree in 1917, and it doesn't seem that impressive. But of course, when someone asks me where I'm from and I say Guelph, they think I'm either in the Vet College, the Agricultural College, or the Home Economics College, because those three colleges have been around for about 150 years. But all of the other colleges, like the College of Biological Science that I'm in, have not been around for nearly as long. So I need to do three things before I actually start with my lecture proper. And clearly the first one is to thank the Alumni Association for inviting me uh, to come here and speak to this, uh, this crowd. This crowd is bigger than my normal lecture crowd because a lot of the kids just sleep. <laughs> It's a tremendous honor for me to be here, and I really appreciate it. And it's also a tremendous honor because I feel like a pseudo-nutritionist. I have not been trained as a formal nutritionist, but the field of sports nutrition is closer to my home, and it's, it's kind of a burgeoning field, and uh, seems like it's uh, quite a timely topic. The other thing I have to do, of course, is to mention that I have worked with 
and received honoraria, I would say small honoraria, from uh, many different organizations where sometimes there's conflicts of interest. So I want to tell you that I have worked quite a bit with Gatorade well before they were purchased by Pepsi. They used to belong to Quaker Oats as a member of the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. And I guess the reason why I have maintained my relationship with them for so long is that they really just ask us for the science. They truly do want to have products that are science-based and I don't have to sell any product. The other thing I've done is gone to several IOC sports nutrition conferences and been involved in many publications and as everyone in the room knows, they have a major benefactor, the Coca-Cola company. If you get to go to one of these, you fly first class. <laughs> and thirdly, uh, the, the third big group that I've been involved in is several sports nutrition, human performance conferences and publications that were sponsored by Nestle, the largest uh, company in the world in that area because they own something called Power Bar that was actually started by a Canadian. Recently, they sold the Power Bar portion of their business to Post. And of course, I've been invited to a lot of other small things, but these are the big ones. The third thing I'd like you to do is just spend one slide on the, the department that I'm in uh, at the present time. It's an interesting department because back in 1994-95, around the same time that Dr. O'Connor left, uh, we in the School of Human Biology, the so-called exercise people, merged with the Department of Nutritional Sciences, the nutrition people. And it's been quite a wonderful marriage over the last uh, 20 years because we have people very interested in nutrition and people very interested in leading an active lifestyle. So we merged and we are now one of three departments in the College of Biological Sciences. Uh, we see ourselves on our campus as the lifestyle department in that we're promoting uh, good nutrition and being physically active or a, an active lifestyle and are trying to do that because we believe the future of health care or to reduce health care in our country is preventative medicine. Before you need some help, let's lead an active lifestyle so that we can uh, not put such a burden on our, on our uh, health system. Uh, I am exactly one week away from being 60 and I'm walking around telling everyone who will listen that 60 is the new 45. <laughs> Except for the first hour in the morning. <laughs> uh, we now have grown quite a bit. We have 27 full-time faculty with 120 graduate students. And we still uh, are very research intensive. We teach a tremendous number of undergrads. We have a large honors BSc majors in human kinetics and also in nutrition and nutraceutical sciences. We also share the biomedical sciences uh, major on our campus with the Ontario Veterinary College where there is a department of biomedical sciences. So students come to this program to take either the human-based stream or the comparative stream if they think they want to be vets or related uh, uh, professions. We also, interestingly, teach half the courses in a Bachelor of Applied Science program in kinesiology with Humber College. There are seven or eight programs between Humber College and the University of Guelph under the banner of the University of Guelph Humber uh, where we team teach the courses. These are people or students who don't want as hardcore science as they would get in the human kinetics program at the University of Guelph. They know they want more practical education. They want to be job ready. They want to be hands on people right after their undergrad degree. Many of them now go and become registered kinesiologists, which is now a profession in Ontario. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, because I know I don't have that much time, I'm gonna quickly go through a lot of points. I will skip over some things, but I will walk you through this. I'm gonna talk about messages related to sweating, body fluids, staying cool, and the effects of mild dehydration on the performance of the serious athlete. And a lot of what I've done and what I will talk about is a the serious athlete. One of the things you'll hear me mention a few times is there's a lot of individual variability between people. Very different if you're studying genetically similar rats where there's not much variance. Human beings, it's all over the board. Uh, I'm also going to discuss the importance of carbohydrate as the high intensity fuel during both endurance sports and what I call decision-making stop-and-go team sports. You people of all people would know 
that many Canadians, you might argue, take in far too much carbohydrate, far too much sugar, primarily because they're not moving, they're not doing any activity. Working with athletes is the exact opposite. You often struggle to get enough fuel into these people to maintain their body mass over training sessions and over seasons. Uh, and the emphasis in this lecture is on the before, during, and after workouts and games, not the 24-hour diet. It's all about what do you do before, during, and after to set you up for the next workout the next day or later in the day. And one of the things you'll hear me talk about quite a bit as well is that the serious athletes of our world are working out virtually every day. And the minute they're done one workout or one competition, they are immediately prepping for the next one because it's not very many hours away. So, athletes obviously need a whole bunch of qualities. They need to be good at producing anaerobic power, sprinting speed. They need to be good at producing aerobic power and have stamina. They need to be strong and do what I call grappling, where they're kind of holding someone off or pushing someone, which is very exhaustive. They need to have skill, they need to have decision making, they need to have psychology. So obviously hydration and nutrition are just two pieces of the puzzle in terms of trying to predict success or maximize success. This is what I often use with, uh, with the athletes themselves, the take home message. Adequate eating and drinking before, during, and after practice and games will maximize your performance. The middle one I like, a proper diet can't make an average athlete elite, but a poor diet can make an elite athlete average. I know, I'm that average person who tries to eat well, unseen to help with my ability. And the trouble selling some of these things to the athletes, if you will, is they can't easily see it. They don't know whether they have enough carbohydrate in their muscles or necessarily whether they're hydrated. So I have done a tremendous amount of work with elite hockey players and mainly we've been working with Canada's junior team since 2005. Although I will point out they did not let us test the teams in the three years where we got bronze medals or nothing. We've always been associated with gold or silver. So we'll see if that holds up this year. Uh, the bottom line is this, not only in hockey, but in most of the stop and, stop and go sports where you're, you're doing aerobic activity and you're sprinting on the back of that and back and forth and so forth, is that if you let yourself get about 2% dehydrated, if you will, 2% of your body mass, you start to see decrements in performance. And you might say, well, what's 2% of my body mass? It's not very much, actually. If you're an 80 kilogram hockey player, 2% of your body mass is 1.6 kilograms or roughly the equivalent of 1.6 liters of fluid. And as I'm going to show you, these players can lose that much fluid, 1.6 liters, think about a liter container, in one hour. Uh, another point I want to make that a lot of people, a lot of athletes don't remember is the importance of water and salt in the body. The body's 65% water. The muscle is 75% water, but it's not really water. Obviously, it has a lot of electrolytes, mainly sodium chloride, potassium. Uh, the extracellular fluid in our body is heavily sodium and heavily chloride, low levels of potassium. So the body's fluid, or at least the extracellular fluid, is actually salt water. And of course, it's a 0.9% salt solution. And that means that in every 100 mLs, I have 0.9 grams of salt, and I have 9 grams of salt in every liter. And to put that in perspective, a teaspoon is 4 grams. So you've got 2 teaspoons of salt in every liter of your extracellular fluid. And interestingly, when you sweat to try to cool yourself, it's not water, it's also salt. So the blood sodium concentration is 140 to 145 millimolar. Fortunately, the sodium we lose in our sweat is less than that, but you can see it's still rather significant, 50 to 70 millimolar, and in the brackets we have the human variability. You have people that genetically lose a lot of salt in their sweat and people who don't. Uh, the other thing that's important about the fluid in our body, of course, is that it's very valuable when we sweat because we can dissipate heat. So if you're exercising, obviously you've got a lot of muscle contractions and they generate a lot of heat. That heat is returned to the core of the body with the venous blood and it increases the core temp. Signals of an increased core temp and to a lesser degree increased skin temp turn on the sweating process 
And you, of course, are sweating and dissipating uh, the heat from the sweat to de decrease your core temp. The body has decided it's impossible to keep the core temp at 37 degrees C, and we'll let it go up to 38, 38 and a half, but we can't let it rise out of control because you can get heat exhaustion when you get beyond 39 degrees Celsius. So the way we get rid of the heat is that we send blood flow to the skin and that heat is translated into the fluid that comes out as sweat and we dissipate it. And that's how you manage to keep yourself cool or at least cooler than you would be if you didn't sweat. Now the problem with that is if you sweat a lot and you sweat for a long period of time, your blood volume or your, more specifically, your plasma volume goes down and you have more trouble sending blood flow to the skin. When push comes to shove, the body will decide not to send it to the skin and send it to the working muscles. And you get let, less heat transfer and then you get a rise in your core temperature. So the bottom line is we have this wonderful system for staying cool, but it costs something. And what it costs is fluid. And as we'll see, for elite athletes, they can't afford to lose too much fluid. Here's an example of a study we did with ice hockey players where we have scrimmage time along the bottom, and we have the core temperature of these players on the y-axis. Each of these players swallowed a pill that allows us to go up behind them and measure their core temp every time they hit the bench. And there's two lines there. The upper line is the so-called no fluid situation where they had to play this entire scrimmage with nothing to drink. And then the bottom one is where they had a carbohydrate electrolyte solution. And really the point is that when you can't take any fluid in, it curtails your ability to get the heat out of the body and you are hotter all the way through the exercise. And generally, the, more, the hotter you are, the more signals your brain receives about discomfort. So that's a practical example of what happens. And you'll notice the body mass loss here is not that great. It's 1.94%. If you try to measure aspects of performance in the same study, you'll see that in every case, the no fluid trial seems to perform poor, whether it's time with the puck, pass completion, turnovers during the scrimmage, et cetera, because we film these players in all of their uh, competitions. And we motivated these young males at the University of Guelph with money for the team that won. And it was only $10 per player, but I don't know, that seemed to be a big motivation for them. <laughs> Free hockey plus maybe you win $10 to have lunch. Uh, if you ask them about how they feel at the end, post scrimmage fatigue scores, and you use the profile of mood scores or this hockey fatigue questionnaire, many of the values that are looked at are statistically significant between the no fluid group and the CES group. Even the ones that are not are all moving in the direction of not feeling as well. And of course, I have to point out here that one of the problems with doing these studies is you can't blind these people because they know when they're in the no fluid trial and they know when they're in the fluid trial. You could complicate things by having different fluids in the, in the, no, in the fluid trials, but between the no fluid and the fluid, they know which uh, group they're in. So what we do when we test teams is we test all the players and we measure how much they sweat, how much they drink, how salty their sweat is by using sweat patches, and we give them individual feedback. And typically when we test a team, we see that about a third of the players are heavy sweaters, possibly heavy salt sweaters, and are losing too much fluid during their practices or their games, and we're able to sit down with them and say, this is what you should aspire. And quite frankly, if you are a high sweater and a high salt sweater, playing a game where the sweat rates are high, you are at a disadvantage versus the people that are on the low end of the spectrum because you will have to work harder at replenishing that to make sure you don't become mildly dehydrated. But on the other hand, there's very talented players and not so talented players on the team as well. Here are some sample sweat rates of various teams that we've done. I would draw your attention to the NHL teams that we've tested during practices. Look at these horrendously high sweat rates, 1.8 to 2.2 liters per hour. Now granted, they're big bodies, and in the case of the Pens and the Sabres, they actually exercised for an hour and a half, so 3.16 liters was the average sweat loss for that group, average. Some of them were quite a bit higher, some of them were lower. Uh, you can go down the list, there's lots of uh, different values here. 
If you go down to uh, an Ontario Hockey League team, the Guelph Storm during games, 3.2 liters, and then look at some of these. We've been contacted by various NHL teams that have heavy sweaters that are cramping and whatnot to come in and assess it and try to help them get by it. So we have quite a few NHL players that lose four to five liters during the course of a game because they're playing so hard, they have to wear all the equipment that makes it difficult to dissipate heat, and they're highly trained. And highly trained athletes sweat quicker and sweat more than an untrained individual. So here are two examples of players we've tested. So player number one uh, reported some cramping during games. Average ice time of forward, hydrated before the game. So he went into the game well hydrated, heavy sweater, drinks a lot. Sweat 5.2 liters, did very well. Drank 3.8 liters during the course of the game in the intermissions. Still lost 2.2% of his body mass. A lot of what he drank was water with no salt in it, and a lot of it got heat out, if you will. 700 milliliters of urine. He lost nine grams of table salt, replaced a little bit, and consumed quite a bit of carbohydrate in the drink he drank. So we gave him a tailored program to try to help him prevent this. This person is at the limit of what a, a human can handle during this time period in terms of drinking. We also advised him not to wear any clothing under his equipment to try to help to dissipate the heat. Second player, forward, average ice time, hydrated before the game. He didn't sweat as much, only 3.4 liters, but drank very little. So he ended up being 3% dehydrated. And you'll notice that both player number one, they sought us out because they reported cramping problems. And once we went in and helped them with what they should be drinking, volume and salt content wise, we got rid of that. So, hydration, why is it important? Clear sweat is really important to stay cool, but it's not water, it's salt water. The sweat rates are ridiculously high in team sports. Many people are surprised that hockey sweat rates would be so high compared to tennis in the heat, football in the heat, etc. But I think a lot of it is to do with the equipment. It's like a microclimate underneath the equipment and that's what causes them to sweat so much. Um, losses of about 2% body mass, like increased heart rate, decreased plasma volume, increased core temperature, are all things that lead to symptoms of fatigue. And we see it happening well before they get 2% body mass loss. But it's the 2% body mass loss that seems to be the border for performance decrement. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that uh, they perceive the effort that they're going through as much harder when they're not hydrated. And anecdotally, when you do these studies and you ask the subject to do a, new, a, no, a no fluid trial, and then maybe you repeat it three weeks later, they are not happy because they've experienced it once. And anecdotally, it's really powerful. Uh, the cool thing is you can test yourself or your player's hydration status and it's very non-invasive. You can simply weigh yourself before and after the activity, keep track of what you drink, and you can figure out what your sweat rate is. And uh, you can do that in different climates or different situations and determine whether this is something you have to worry about or what you're doing is fine. The one thing I will say is there's a tremendous amount of variability between people. So weigh the athlete pre and post activity as I said before, a lot of the athletes, we simply give them positive feedback. This is how much you sweat, you're taking in enough fluid during the activity, and you're good to go. Um, and the other thing that we've been pushing very hard with these athletes that train every day is the better you stay hydrated on day one, the less recovery you have to prepare for day two. Quite a few cases in the NHL of goaltenders who are stopping a lot of shots losing six, seven, eight pounds, they say they cannot get ready in the 20 hours they have for the game the next night. Okay, so conclusion, staying hydrated in the real athletic world. Uh, education of the players, I think, is working. Uh, when we went to test the World Juniors 10 years ago, no one seemed to be aware of the importance of staying hydrated. Now they all do. We rarely see anybody get dehydrated now. It's like I told my students, we've kind of worked ourselves out of a job. Um, the players do seem to accept the message in that there is value in staying hydrated and so do the coaches in that they allow the players to drink while they're 
showing them the next drill and purposely build in breaks uh, during, during the practices and there are lots of drinks on the bench during games. Uh, and the players do take it forward to the pros because we've looked very carefully at the players we've tested and you can see them on the bench what they're drinking uh, because the television is on them so much. And I must say though that hockey is well suited to staying hydrated because you're coming back to the bench so often. A lot of other sports like rugby and soccer and various other games, very few opportunities to take in fluid. And I think especially with something like soccer, soccer in the heat, that that's going to have to change uh, going forward. Okay, now I'm going to flip over and talk about carbohydrate and energy production and fueling your athlete. And I'm going to start with some very basic things because I realize we have a wide audience. Everyone here knows that in your skeletal muscle you can make energy aerobically in the mitochondria using basically fat and carbohydrate as a fuel. But we also have the ability to make energy using no oxygen, affectionately termed anaerobic ATP production. And again, carbohydrate is a fuel for that energy source. And then we have this wonderful other compound called phosphocreatin that can make energy for us. Here's my little picture to show you where the fuel is in your body. At the bottom we have the muscle. And if you're a well-trained athlete, you will have a lot of carbohydrates stored as glycogen. But you will also have a lot of fat stored as IMTG or intramuscular fat. And people are often surprised that the energetic value of the fat stored in the muscle is often as much or more as the carbohydrate. Depends on the sport you're doing. Then I've got a band that's supposed to represent the blood because I want to make sure everyone realizes we can also mobilize energy for the contracting muscle from the liver that has glycogen. And of course, we have no shortage, even the leanest individual, of adipose tissue fat stores. On top of that, you could argue that you can help the body, the liver, the blood, the brain uh, during exercise by consuming a drink that has small amounts of carbohydrate because it gets rapidly absorbed and it can help the blood glucose concentration stay uh, normal. It can ease the need for carbohydrate from um, the liver. And of course, we now know that carbohydrate in the mouth during activity can also be sensed by receptors in the mouth and that, can, that information can be sent to the brain. So knowing that, here's an example of measurements that tried to figure out where the energy comes from when you're working not very hard at 25% VO2 max, walking, moderate exercise at 65, and pretty intense exercise at 85%. And the y-axis is just how hard are you working, how much energy are you expending. And the point I want you to see is that when you're walking, most of the energy can come from plasma fats and plasma glucose. But as you start to work harder, the top two bars, the intramuscular fat and the glycogen, provide more and more energy. And what I really want you to see is that the intense workload, look how important muscle glycogen and at the bottom plasma glucose are. So we shift away from fat and towards carbohydrate the harder we work. So it becomes your imp important fuel during exercise. And my take home message is that if you're doing aerobic intensity exercise that's intense, and of course marathon runners and people that do distance work are often working at 90, 95% of their, their maximal oxygen uptake, um, they're going to rely very, very heavily on carbohydrate. There's a big debate in my world as to whether or not a person that runs a marathon in crazy time of two, two hours and two minutes and some seconds might rely almost 100% on carbohydrate for fuel during that race because it's at such a high intensity. If you're interested in the rates of carbohydrate they get used by athletes, I would recommend this really good review article by John Hawley and Jill Leckie on, in, the, in the journal Sports Medicine. It's just come online. Now, what about anaerobic energy? The energy we need to do changes of pace, sprinting, jumping, etc. Typically you need it in three situations when you transition. If you're going from rest to exercise or one power output to a higher one, you're going to have to contribute energy from the anaerobic system. The other thing is we like to do activity that's way above what the aerobic system can handle and the anaerobic system has to help us achieve that. And then if you do silly things like you go high altitude and try to exercise, 
or you stick your head in the water and swim, where you can't breathe as much as you like, then you're going to have to rely on anaerobic energy as well. Just to re I apologize for this, but just to remind you that we have phosphocreatin that in one reaction can produce ATP for us, so it's real fast. And then we have the glycolytic pathway that has 10 or 11 steps, and even though there's that many steps, it also produces energy very, very quickly. We call that anaerobic glycolysis. And these two systems have some strengths that the aerobic system does not. And that's what I have here. So the aerobic system, as I said, if you're well fed, you're going to use fat and carbohydrate. It's a great system for producing energy at a decent rate for a long time. It's not too quick to turn on. It often takes a minute, minute and a half, two minutes to get up to what we call a steady state where it's producing as much energy as it can. And the great thing is you can really train this to get better at it if you want to. A lot of people call it the default energy source. As you're sitting here, you're using oxidative energy. Anaerobic, on the other hand, has a different purpose. Again, carbohydrate is a substrate and phosphocreatin, but numbers one and number two are its specialties. Very, very quick to turn on. Turns on like a light switch, if you will, milliseconds. And it can also produce energy for very high rates. But as we all know, if you jumped out of your chair and you sprinted out of this room, and just kept going, all of a sudden you start to get tired as you go farther and farther because you can use up your phosphocreatin quite quickly and there are byproducts associated with the glycolytic system that make the muscle more acidic and you start to slow down. Um, the anaerobic glycolytic system can be trained but frustratingly when you train your phosphocreatin store does not go up. If I had more time we could talk about supplemental creatine uh, nutritional uh, supplement, but I don't have time for that today. So here's one example of when you need your anaerobic stores. I've got time on this axis and the oxygen uptake or how hard you're working on the, the y-axis. And this isn't too tough, 1.75 liters per minute. But the dark line shows you the time course of turning on the aerobic system. Pretty sluggish. The hatched area is all the energy I'm going to have to provide during that transition from the anaerobic Sources. So in this example, you can see how the aerobic and the anaerobic system work together. My students always tell me that it's either aerobic or anaerobic. It almost never is. It's always the two working together. Here's another example. This is totally different. This is a single six-second sprint where you're going as hard as you can. You're probably working at a power output that's 150, 200 percent of what you could handle aerobically. So we have no choice but to rely on anaerobic energy. And what I want you to see is that in the first six seconds, most of the anaerobic energy is split between from phosphocreatin and from carbohydrate. And you can see that I'm harping on the carbohydrate because it's such a powerful fuel. It's good for high intensity aerobic exercise and also anaerobic. Here's a summary of the glycogen utilization rates on the y-axis and how hard you're working on the uh, x-axis. When you're in the so-called aerobic domain where you can produce most of the energy aerobically, you're using the glycogen at a relatively slow rate. The minute you start to sprint, the use of uh, glycogen is exponential because from one molecule of glucose, we only get three ATP when we do it anaerobically versus 36 to 39 if we use it aerobically. So the take home point over there is that sprinting costs a lot of carbohydrate fuel. So if you're playing a stop and go game where you're sprinting, slowing down, sprinting, slowing down, you will need a lot of carbohydrate to be successful at that sport. So carbohydrate here are all the things it can do. I've pretty much gone over them all. As an exercise physiologist interested in nutrition, I'm bummed out by this. I don't know who designed the body and why they didn't give us the ability to store more carbohydrate. Why can't I have twice the phosphocreatin that I have in my muscles? There are examples in the comparative world where they have that. Uh, there's lots of animals that are better sprinters than us and much higher aerobic capacity and I don't know why we're mired where we are. I would like to be able to unlock that, but so far I haven't figured that out. And then, I don't want to not mention fat, because fat is a fuel, we often call it a helper fuel, because it can only be used aerobic. It's not great for high intensities, but it's really good for lower intensities between sprints and recovery. 
And of course, if you eat a diet that has enough carbohydrate, you will not be oxidizing much protein. Protein's playing a much bigger role for these people in recovery. So the bottom line is that in endurance and stop and go sports, performance is limited by energy and particularly carbohydrate intake. That's a statement from one of these IOC uh, sports nutrition conferences. The other thing I just want to spend two slides on is this business of sensing carbohydrate in the mouth. And that's sending signals to the brain. And what it seems to do in the brain is make you feel better and you seem to be able to handle fatiguing situations to a greater extent. Basically what happened is people were seeing that giving a carbohydrate solution during intense exercise was leading to improvements in performance when the exercise was relatively short and shouldn't run out of problems before, or run out of glycogen before you fatigue. So they started to think, well, it must be a central phenomenon. There must be something that is allowing us to feel better and do better when carbohydrates around. And the amounts of carbohydrate that they brought in during these mouth rinse studies where they would rinse the mouth for, mouth for five seconds and then spit it out, uh, wasn't enough to really make a dent in the fuel use. And so this is what started to hit the literature in the mid-2000s. Uh, People then, this is a very good study in the Journal of Physiology where they actually did some scanning of the brain and were able to show that areas of the brain associated with reward, motor activity, feeling better, uh, lit up when carbohydrate went into the mouth. So it's a very cool system. Similar studies are starting to come to the forefront about signals in the gut that we can also sense what comes in the gut, at least with the, with the carbohydrate side, and that may be having an effect on performance as well. So clearly, if, if carbohydrate is that important, not surprisingly, the sports nutritionists have gone hard at figuring out ways to maximize storage of body carbohydrate before the event. My uh, postdoc mentor, Dr. Eric Holtman, was the first man to figure out that if you exercised hard and used up most of the glycogen in the muscles and then went and ate a lot of carbohydrate, you could actually replenish the stores above where you started, the so-called so carbohydrate loading. Well, elite athletes are doing that all the time, so they're constantly doing that. The other thing is that you can consume carbohydrate during some events to help the system, and then we need to maximize the recovery right after the event if exercise is coming again later that day or tomorrow. And serious effort has gone into these recommendations, but I would argue that one of the problems with the recommendations is they're just general recommendations, and you really have to attack this on an individual basis. And of course, I'm sure many of you that are interested in exercise would see these types of guidelines that in the days prior to a serious competition, this is how much carbohydrate you take, depending on uh, what group of athlete you fall into, why people want to exercise four to six hours a day, like triathletes, I, I really don't understand. It's sort of like mountain climbing, uh, but they do it. So we have to try to keep them fueled. Uh, the other thing is right before the event, you can have a breakfast uh, two to four hours before that has enough carbohydrate content in it, and that will help mainly your liver carbohydrate store and could optimize the muscle. Um, we generally recommend not too much carbohydrate as you work up to the exercise. Uh, usually we're looking for 60 grams in the last two hours before the event. A lot of people get this by drinking a drink that has a little bit of carbohydrate in it slowly over that time period. Uh, during the competition, this is an interesting one. Ingestion of carbohydrate during events assists in maintaining the blood glucose. Uh, the carbohydrate supplementation has been shown to enhance performance not only in endurance, but shorter stop and go uh, team exercise tasks. We think it's probably a central thing. For endurance activity, 6% carbohydrate in the drink seems to be the most you can handle before it starts to slow down the absorption of the fluid. Um, remember, 6% is 6 grams in every 100 ml. So if you drink a liter of a 6% sports drink, that's 60 grams of carbohydrate. And it's probably less for team sports because their, their activity is hard, less hard, less, etc. 
So we suggest for most of the team sports that they are shoot for 30 to 60 grams, assuming the team sport lasts an hour or longer. And this is where we get into a well-formulated sports drink. I cannot tell you the number of times I've been working with athletes and they're telling me about how complicated sports drinks are, and of course they're not very complicated. The water, I would argue, is still the most important ingredient. You have to stay hydrated. Secondly, low levels of sugar. Everybody tells me that sports drinks are loaded with sugar. They have about half or less the carbohydrate that milk or juices have. Lots of people are liking the, what I call diet sports drinks that have two or two and a half percent carbohydrate, especially if you're not working out as hard as some of these athletes. But the sugar is there to help main the, maintain the fueling of the muscles and the brain. People forget that the brain loves carbohydrate. Of course, there's a little bit of salt in these drinks as well. People also tell me that they're highly salted. They are not highly salted. A sports drink usually has a sodium concentration of 20 millimolar. If you're an endurance athlete, you can buy sports drinks that have 40 millimolar. Most of us working with athletes would argue that all the drinks should have 50 millimolar for athletes. So they're on the low side with respect to salt. If you have a high salt sweater, we often spike their sports drink with extra salt because they lose so much. And then some people would argue the fourth thing is the flavor which encourages people to drink. And some people would argue the fifth thing is some of the preservatives and the other things they put in these drinks. So what about recovery after exercise? So if you're a high-end athlete, you cannot do a hard workout and then not eat or take in any fuel or fluid for three, four, five hours because you're simply delaying the recovery. And uh, the recovery of the carbohydrate into muscles is another thing I'm not very happy about. It takes 20 to 24 hours. If I could figure out a way to replenish the carbohydrate in the muscles I need for the activity, I would do that in a heartbeat because a lot of athletes have less than 24 hours to recover. So what we recommend for carbohydrate is 1 to 1.2 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body mass per hour in the first hour or the second hour before you actually eat a meal. And that carbohydrate, of course, can be given as food. A lot of the athletes won't take it. They need it in fluid for the first hour or something, so we uh, deal with that appropriately. Uh, the other important thing, of course, is there's been a lot of studies done, many of them at McMaster University, about the importance of protein right after exercise. Basically, they, they show that you need 20 to 25 grams of protein with essential amino acids, especially leucine, to increase muscle protein synthesis so that the muscle protein synthetic rate is higher than the muscle breakdown rate and you're in a net protein balance as soon as you possibly can. Depressingly, they also have studies showing that people that are 60 need about 40 grams to make this happen. So, so the bottom line after exercise is basically what you're looking to give your athletes is a healthy snack. Maybe once, maybe twice before they actually eat. And of course, you see a lot of commercials about chocolate milk. Chocolate milk is uh, 500 ml, has 50 grams of carbohydrate approximately, 20 to 25 grams of protein, about 3 grams of fat. And if you look at the recovery drinks that Mead and Gatorade and the various other companies produce, exactly the same. It's just they got more flavors and they got this and they got that. So whatever you do, it works. Uh, so I will summarize because I'm probably a little over time already. Uh, athletes have very high sweat rates and of course it's there for them to stay cool. And the funny thing is that they get better at sweating the more trained they are and therefore the price you pay is to try and replace that fluid if the exercise lasts for a long time, which it often does. Hydration is important to minimize net body fluid loss and maintain performance. Somewhere in the range of 2% body mass loss, we start to get concerned. The other point is, hydration is not an issue if you're doing physical activity where you're not sweating very much. I get asked all the time to come out and check out the eight-year-old house league hockey team <laughs> and how much we need to drink. Well, I can stand there and watch it and know the kids are standing around on the ice quite a bit. They've only got half the ice to, to go, 
some of them can't skate, so they can't. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you have to keep it under perspective. Having said that, I have been to novice AAA All-Star team practices. They don't practice 50 minutes, they practice an hour and 20. Those kids are drenched when they come off the ice because they can skate and they run through. So it's very situational. Most often I'm telling people, you don't need a sports drink, you don't even need water because you're not working hard enough. Uh, stop and go team sports require aerobic and anaerobic energy production and the aerobic system is important during the activity but it's also really important during the downtime or the slow down times because it replenishes phosphocreatine, it oxidizes lactate, etc, etc. Carbohydrate is the fuel of choice during endurance and stop and go team sports. The fuel for both energy pathways which makes it so unique you can maximize the ability of the carbohydrate before, during, and after, but it's a harder sell with the athletes. They're always telling me that they've heard in the literature that sugar is bad for them, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the ironic thing with these people is that during the activity and right after the activity, it's actually the simple sugars we want them to take because we want it to get into the system quickly. And what they don't realize is that if you do an oral glucose tolerance test on these athletes, you can barely see a blip in their blood sugar because they just sop this up like anything because they're well trained. So it's a large percentage of the population and then this unique crowd that you're working with. Uh, so obviously in sports many factors dictate that athletes are dealt with on an individual basis. There's so many things that come into what you might recommend to an athlete. Uh, all of these things I have down here. One of the coolest things I've seen happening is that professional sports teams and even sports teams under are now starting to wise up and hiring directors of sports science. They're hiring full-time nutritionists, et cetera, et cetera, because they realize that staying hydrated, staying fueled, having a good nutrition plan is good for their team, is good for the uh, longevity of the players and so forth. So that's really, I don't know if any of you people in the audience know Jen Saigo, who does a lot of nutritional writing. Well, she's been hired by the Toronto Maple Leaf. We went and tested the Buffalo Sabres. They have a brand new Department of, uh, Department of Sports Sciences, and they now have a full-time nutritionist working with their team. So it's, it seems to be uh, coming and coming and being more and more important, more in the limelight. Thank you for your attention. Sorry, I went over a little bit. Sure. So, so I, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do. And I would argue that if your goal is weight loss, I wouldn't take anything before, during, or after, unless the exercise is really extreme. So it's, you know, it's, it depends on the individual. Um, if the individual likes to exercise every day, then you might think more seriously about what you would take right after. I would argue that if you go out for a run, and you're going to have something to eat at your house within 15, 30 minutes, an hour, that's fine. So this is very unique to that situation. I mean, the classic is a bunch of people walking around the block a few times drinking a sports drink. And when you do the calculation, they've taken in more kilocals than they've burned. <laughs> so you know, it, it's common sense, right? And so um, a lot of people are disappointed when they contact me. They say, we'd like you to you know, come and measure our players and this and that. And I say, I say well, I've watched your practice. So you don't need anything. You know, or I might see two kids that are flying around the ice, I watch them, they're drenched. So I'll come back to the next practice and I'll just weigh them before and after and see how serious it is. And most often it's not very serious. So the one, the one proviso I would put in on that is kids doing tournaments. Where, I don't know, you people have probably experienced this, your, your child plays a lacrosse game, you got three hours to the next game and what are they doing? They're outside in the sun playing lacrosse between the games. So there, I think, having a nutrition plan where 
they eat something after the first game, drink something, and then move on to the next one makes sense. But uh, in a lot of cases, you know, it's not required. And, and that's why I'm so high on weighing yourself, right? I mean, if you weigh 70 kilograms and you go out for the hardest workout you're ever going to have, and you didn't drink anything, and you only lost one kilogram, you're good. You know, so. Hey, lecture has just been very uh, eye-opening. I just got one question. You see on TV where a hockey player is constantly hydrating himself. From what you tell me, I assume it's electrolyte of some kind. Is this something that the organization, organization provides for all of them, or are they individualized for each pair for heavy sweaters or for yeah. you know, more sodium? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so let's just take the National Hockey League. They have a sponsorship with Gatorade. So they have as much Gatorade products as they want. A lot of the pros don't use it. They use their own products. Good example is BioSteel. BioSteel was produced by a man named Matt Nickel, who is a strength and conditioning coach. And it's very similar to Gatorade, except it has no sugar. Because some people believe that sugar is bad for you and that you don't need sugar for high intensity sport. So, you know, some athletes will say to me, I'm not drinking a sugar solution. I say, fine, have the water, have the electrolytes, and go from there. So, um, most of the players will get access to the products and they have the strength and conditioning coaches or hopefully a nutritionist to guide them as to when they should take them. But it's the four or five that I mentioned here that are heavy sweaters and have problems that get individual things. Um, the Brazilian soccer team, the Gatorade company is embedded with them and produces individualized nutrition and hydration for all the players. I don't know if that explains how they got beat by Germany 6-0 in the semifinal, but not good for press, but you know, there's a lot of that. So it's individualized, but a lot of them, they're doing a good job. They don't, you really don't have to mess with them. So yeah, they all have electrolytes. We're, we're high on putting the electrolytes back that you lose. And obviously you're gonna get most of the salt back in the food you eat, but reducing the loss, uh, maybe the most poignant situation are the triathletes. So the triathletes that want to do Ironman Iron Man competitions, for a lot of us it would take 10, 11, 12 hours. We bring them in and we have them ride at the intensity they will ride at in the climate they will experience for one hour. We measure their sweat rate, their salt loss. And we do the same thing with the running because you can't afford to lose much salt. You have to put some fuel back if you're going to keep doing this for 10 or 12 hours. And they are a serious bunch. They keep track of everything. And sometimes we've had to tell people to back down on the salt because they're taking too much or back down on the fluid. So it can be very individualized and it's, it's a function of whether you have the money and the people to carry it out. Like I would argue that if you have six or nine really good players on your team, you need to take a good look at what happens to them during the practice and during the game and make sure that they're not in situations where they have serious recovery between games. Yep. Yeah. That's a good question because you'll see that if you just look at it, most of the females aren't working, aren't sweating. This is kind of a hard um, this is a bit controversial uh, in the literature. Um, so I would say that the two female groups that we've tested, the Canadian Women's Olympic Team, and then our varsity team at the University of Guelph, I believe their sweat rates are slightly lower because the practices we tested them on were not as vigorous. Um, the Gatorade Lab has 5,000 sweat tests uh, with many, many women, and their conclusion is the sweat rates in women is just as high as it is in men. So if it's lower in women, it's very much lower. Fifteen years ago, there were things in the literature saying that a woman who exercised hard couldn't become hypoglycemic or couldn't use up all of the glycogen in their legs during the exercise. Complete nonsense. When you exercise the ladies hard, they lose it all just like the men. And some of the ladies near the end of the exercise test swear just like the men as well. <laughs> Mentioned that there are these individuals that down with sweat more and those who 
Uh, yeah, the you know I I don't know in athletes because there's not many athletes that have those problems. The one the one thing I will say though is that I think your diet has a big effect on it. When when we tested the Toronto Raptors, there were quite a few Europeans, and they all had very low salt sweat. And people argue it's their diet, whereas the African Americans really high, and so probably a genetic factor, but I believe also a dietary factor, but I'm not aware of any studies that would have taken athletes and said, I'm going to measure the salt in your diet for a week or two, and then I'm going to alter it and see if it translates into, uh, into uh, actually losing less salt. There is some suggestion that you get this, the eccrine, the sweat glands get better at resorbing the salt as you train, but the trouble is that's kind of balanced by the fact that you sweat quicker and you sweat more. And the faster you sweat, the faster the fluid moves through the eccrine gland, and there's less time for... Um, and of course, uh, people with cystic fibrosis lack the ability to resorb uh, the electrolytes, so they quite often will have sweat concentrations that approach blood, 130, 140. And you might see a little sweat analyzer in a doctor's office, because that's what they use to screen for that. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. If you saw that, you would target that person right away. And a lot of the players that have hats and stuff, you can just see it in their locker, it's sitting there. Yeah, there's no question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I know. And uh, they attribute it to, as a company attribute it to the branching amino acids as well as the electrolytes in there. I was wondering if you speak to that. Yeah, no, I don't believe that. Uh, there's no. <laughs> I mean, branch chain amino acids are not a fuel during exercise for people that aren't on some kind of calorie restricted diet. Uh, many studies have shown that branch chain amino acids do nothing during exercise. Uh, they're very important after exercise for recovery. Some people argue, well, I'm going to start taking them during exercise. The other thing I don't like about BioSteel, it's really low in electrolyte content, even lower. I mean, I'm not a fan of 20 millimolar salt in a sports drink. I'm a fan of much higher than that. But of course, Gatorade argues that we can't put it any higher because we know that 75% of our product will be consumed in a non-active situation. <laughs> so you have to balance it. And that's why they have products like the Gatorade Endurance that has twice the salt and it's directed for endurance athletes or athletes that sweat a lot. Or they have also products that have less sugar. So it's directed for light uh, people active, uh, in lighter active situations. So, you know, there's a whole bunch more other than BioSteel that have a whole bunch of things. It's a lot like the energy drink. Okay, if you look at Red Bull, it's got a lot of things, but there's no evidence that anything in there does anything except carbohydrate and caffeine. <laughs> Even the taurine, we did a bunch of studies on the taurine, we cannot see any beneficial effect of the taurine. Um, taurine is the uh, very, very prevalent amino acid in skeletal muscle. And clearly, if you have a taurine deficiency, your muscle performance goes down, but no one has been able to show, well, first of all, no one has been able to increase the taurine level in the muscle and show that it has any effect. So, you know, it's like anything, any of these products. You can say whatever you want, but show me that you can back it up. Yeah. I do too. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's very interesting you should mention that. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, sorry, I have, to, I have to make a comment on that. <laughs> you and I need to talk. <laughs> uh, so, so recently, Sleeman has come out with a new beer 
because of course the beers have the carbohydrate that you might need to replace the carbohydrate in your liver and your muscles, but they've added 110 milligrams of sodium, and they're calling that beer Lyft. <laughs> And it has 4% alcohol, which is probably also good for me, <laughs> that it's light. But they're trying to, they're thinking about doing some studies to determine whether or not you hydrate better with a drink that has a little bit of salt in it, because you can't put too much salt in the beer or it doesn't taste very good. So that's actually on the radar of Sleeman, which is owned by Sapporo. And I agree with you. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question as well. So, you know, there's been a lot of debate about this. Um, do you give fructose? Do you give sucrose? Do you do maltodextrins? And most of the sports drink companies are giving mainly glucose and then a third fructose. And the reason for that is that there are, there are independent transporters in the gut for fructose. And you can saturate the glucose transporters and then add some fructose into the drink and increase the amount of carbohydrate that gets across into the gut. I would argue that's probably not that important for stop and go athletes, but it's clearly important for the world class triathletes, runners and so forth. So the recommendations for the longest time, for the maximum amount of carbohydrate you could take in, absorb and oxidize in an hour was 60 grams, so one gram a minute. And then they started adding amounts of fructose in it to try to take advantage of these extra transporters. And now there's data in the literature showing that you can increase it to 90 grams per hour. But that probably doesn't have a lot of a, a relevance for a lot of the athletes that aren't these extreme endurance athletes. Because the gut, the gut actually is the limiting factor for how quickly you can get it across during exercise. Thank you very much for that.